So first of all, I just want to say, honestly, oh. uh, it's an honor. It's an honor to be a part of Open Computers. Um, it's been great working with everybody, and I, I hope to continue to make great improvements uh, to OpenOS, and maybe one day make some improvements to the rest of the code if I stop getting scared of all the crazy Scala stuff that's out there. Um, so I would say my time working with mods in Minecraft has mainly been as a, a hoster of uh, mod packs and private servers. Um, I work in my my own time as a C++ developer and uh, had a big interest in open computers for you know the interface that it, you know kind of the, the computer interface that it gave me to the Minecraft world. And my interest in improving OpenOS first began with wanting to make it more Bash-like, wanting to look at the the standard input output so that I could write some some remote shell code and things like that. And I continued to find little things deep inside the code that I I needed to tweak. And then at one point it just kind of I snapped. <laughs> And I, I, I messaged Sangar and I said, you know, I'd, I'd like to make a lot of changes. And his response was basically, well, just start making the changes and, you know, we'll see if we like them. And uh, I, most of the stuff I wanted to do, I, I think, was received well. Um, some of the stuff started to get a little bit too complex. wasn't really the experience that open computers are trying to provide, so we tried to stay away from those things. Uh, I learned a lot about what I think Sangar wants out of this mod. And I, I definitely hope that what I've done has improved the experience for everybody. Um, so yeah. Anyways, that's my little You're intro. You're awesome. Ah, thanks. <laughs> I definitely don't want to take the spotlight. This to me is the community's mod, and 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 Songar is the creator. Um, but I thought if I were to put my name anywhere, maybe it would just be this presentation. Uh, but anyways, let's let's move on. Did we take the keyboard off? No. There we go. Okay, it's working. So this presentation will cover two main things. What is OpenOS 1.6? What have I seen or heard about OpenOS or Open Computers in the tutorial spotlights or even in the forums that's inaccurate and incomplete? But as I try to answer that second question, it's a huge topic. You know, what's incomplete or what's been inaccurate? And so I I had this slide up to point people to the efforts that we're doing outside of just this presentation. Uh, definitely there's been work done on OC Doc to improve the documentation. It's an ongoing effort. Uh, it's come a long way, I would say, in the last month or two before BTM. We have the forums, and we also have the OC channel on Espernet, where, you know, usually people are mostly kind. Uh, it's a good place to hang out, ask your questions, you get to meet some other developers that have worked on this project and people who have a lot of experience. And sometimes I believe as, as Fox has seen, it's just dead quiet. Um, he seems to have the luck to come in there when there's nobody hanging out. <laughs> um, but this, this talk, I think we'll focus on just some of the experiences people have wanted out of open computers, perhaps what they didn't quite understand. And, and then some things that are new in open OS, I, I guess, that's that should be what the focus is. Is what what does OpenOS 1.6 bring? So the first image that I have here is a highlight effect that that's built into the cases when when you mouse over a component, and you'll see the slots that it can go into. So Open Computers deals with three tiers: one, two, and three. And you can see that with the Roman numerals. This has been talked about in other presentations and other tutorials, but there's a couple of things about this that I, I felt were worth bringing up. So I'll just cover it quickly. When trying to figure out what components can fit into a computer case, the tier number in Roman numeral in the slots will tell you what will fit. When you mouse over a component like a GPU or a CPU or even a hard drive, it has its own tier and it will highlight it in the case for you to let you know. So a tier one case will have, now I have to uh, check my notes because for time I, I cut out some of the slides, so one second. Okay, so in the tier one case we have the options for tier one components. The tier two case is tier two and anything, anything less. So whenever, it, it acts like a, a minimum. 
So when the case says, say, Roman numeral 2, that's, that's the best it can hold. Uh, what, this is the tier 1 case image. It can only hear, hold tier 1 things. Um, let's go through the next slide. I'm going to kind of skip ahead. Oh, here we have a demonstration of, of a rack. All these are server blades. They're a little bit more advanced as far as cases are concerned. And they have better allowances. Um, and here we have the tier 1 GPU. The reason I wanted to bring it up was one of the things that I have sometimes misheard was when people are trying to set up their computers, they, there's a slight misunderstanding about what the screen can show. And the tier 1 GPU, or the different tiers of GPU, they, as you increase, they, they can do better graphics and higher resolution, but that will be limited or throttled by the screen. So a tier 1 GPU can bind to any screen, 1, 2, or 3. And a tier 3 GPU can bind to any screen as well. But the screen will limit what it can do. So if you're trying to do high resolution graphics, or if you're trying to do uh, multiple colors, then that's limited by whatever is least between the two. You need a higher GPU and a higher screen. But let's talk back about memory. So here we have an image of all the memory types, tier 1, 1, 5, 2, 2, 5, 3, and 3, 5. And these 0.5 memory tiers are a, a huge help for people who are trying to get more memory out of their system but don't want or have limitations on what tiers they can use. So the 0.5 tiers will fit in the equivalent uh, you know, whole number tier. So for example, the second one is the tier 1.5 memory stick, and it provides about... 50 or 60, about 60k more memory. So it's 64 actually. Uh, 64k more memory than the, the tier 1 equivalent. But it still fits in the tier 1 slot. And this is important because if you're going for tier 1 slots, that tier 1 memory is extremely limited. Um, one of the first experiences that our new users will probably have is they're going to build all tier 1 equipment. You know, I think one of the expectations is I can build everything out of tier 1 stuff just to get going with this mod because I think in other mods you start at tier 1 and in open computers you know that's an option but you don't have to start at tier 1 and if everything is tier 1 uh, you might have a bad experience because you're going to run out of memory soon and that's actually one of the big things that I wanted to talk about uh, during this presentation is the memory improvements that OpenOS has made so in OpenOS uh, 1.6, the memory requirements have been heavily optimized. When I first started working on OpenOS, it was quickly brought to my attention that memory is a serious matter for open computers in the community. Um, improving OpenOS for 1.5 to 1.6 was going to be far more complex than just making Linux-like or GNU-like changes to the shell. Um, <laughs> I wonder, yeah, in fact, I have in my notes Vexitos. <laughs> um, he was definitely the one that had the most to say about our, our memory limitations. So the goal was made to uh, to provide at least 50k of memory for the shell once the operating system had booted. So I started doing some profiling and some memory me measurements and I found that OpenOS 1.5 boots to shell consuming it needs uh, 206k. So on a 1.5 tier memory stick, OpenOS 1.5 had 50k free. So in other words, this goal that we had of memory left me with zero bytes to upgrade OpenOS 1.6. Um, so we started at zero. I could not make any, I could not add anything to OpenOS that would take away from that memory. So the first thing to do was profiling, profiling, profiling. Lots of instrumented builds that I made of OpenOS to try to figure out all the places that memory was uh, consumed during boot, which libraries were essential, what things, uh, it, it was, yeah, open, installed PyoTest, yeah. Um, oh, by the way, I, I didn't even put in the notes to mention, thanks Vextos, the, the development of OpenOS also included about 1,300 unit tests, and uh, that was, that was interesting as well. Anyways, um, so after all the profiling, or I should say during all of the work, 
continue to profile the refactors. So optimizing open OS code had to do with moving libraries out of the boot path, uh, optimizing functions. And, and one of the biggest things I learned is that with Lua, you're going to do it. Oh, I'm getting pinged. I don't Sorry, I don't have a, a window. Oh, what is OpenOS? That's a good question. Uh, I kind of didn't even have a slide for that. The, uh, the operating system that we expect our users to use on open computers, or I should say that the core operating system is OpenOS. It, there are other options. People are making some pretty amazing operating systems. And that's, if I may say, one of the challenges I've had in trying to describe OpenOS is I don't want to say it is the only or the op operating system for open computers because open computers absolutely functions without OpenOS. You can have your own. You can write your own EEPROM. Uh, you can use Plan 9K by Magic, for example, uh, or MinOS. Um, this is just one of the loot disks. And all the documentation I would say on OCDoc, assume you're using OpenOS. So um, if I ever make it sound like this is the gold standard operating system, I apologize. Um, it's just this is the one that our documentation expects people are using. That is all. Uh, so that's OpenOS. Anyways, memory optimizations was a pretty big deal. It took a lot of work. And one of the biggest things I learned about Lua was that it's not going to save you memory when you might expect it to. Um, I, th I continue to see, oh, this function isn't even necessary. I can... I can take out this function and write it all in line, or this loop is probably costing some memory, or creating this table. So many times I was wrong. Um, being in a virtual environment with, with Lua, it was a lot of surprises. So it's all about profiling. If, if you yourself are trying to write your own optimized code, or you're trying to write some type of uh, microcontroller and open computers and you're on the memory edge, profile, 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 because your assumptions probably are wrong. Um, but yeah, it was an awesome experience in the end. Okay, before I go on to the next topic, the thing I wanted to mention about the optimizations of OpenOS, when you op optimize code, uh, it generally will make the code harder to read, harder to debug, make some pretty disgusting stack traces. And for that, I do apologize. If anybody's trying to learn about how the operating system works and they're looking into the code, Part of it is that my, my code isn't necessarily very attractive, but the other part is keep in mind that these libraries for boot were optimized for memory, and a lot of times just crazy things happened to make that possible. So here we have the, uh, I don't know why this slide is here. <laughs> it's showing tier 1.5 uh, highlight here. Let me check my notes. Yeah, that's a little bit out of place. That's okay. We're going to move on to the next. I love the tomatoes. You guys are wonderful. Well, it's not going to load the uh, EEPROM image. I'm not sure about that. That's okay. We don't need the image of the EEPROM. So another question that comes up is, you know, what is the Lua EEPROM? What does it provide for us? And I just, it does four basic things real quick. Um, this question came up in some tutorials that I was watching, not, not by Mighty Mighty Pirates, but actually somebody else was doing a spotlight. And they didn't understand the difference between EEPROM and the Lua EEPROM. Uh, and, and the reason this is important is because the little EEPROM is a tiny little chip that can hold just a little bit of memory, a little bit of code. You can put it on your devices. And if, if you want to sneak programs in there, you actually could without even needing a hard drive. So what is the Lua EEPROM, the thing that you can boot? Four things. One, it, it binds the first GPU and the first screen that it can find so that when you start rendering to the GPU, uh, any way to fix mumble link? Oh, sorry about that. I'm getting... I don't know, I'm Sapphire. Trying to talk. <laughs> um, the, it'll bind the first GPU and bind the first screen that it finds so that when you render to the GPU, it'll work. The next thing is that it finds the first file system that has an init init Lua that it can run, or uh, the, which is the boot address. It tries the boot address first. It beeps, and then it calls init. So besides those things, there's nothing special about the init, the, the Lua EEPROM. Um, I mean, it assumes that you have a Lua CPU so that it can interpret the Lua code. But you know, if you handle executing init.lua, then you can have your own EEPROM um, compatible with 
uh, operating systems okay. that expect that you have the low EEPROM, it's, it's a very simple program. Um, in fact, on the latest OpenOS, I'm going to get out of this. In fact, I should probably, if you guys can be patient, I'm going to turn off uh, the button to chat on Mumble. Tomato fight! And uh, my slides won't end. Brilliant. This is Bugs. Be right back. <laughs> <laughs> okay. This will be easier now. I don't have to hold down a button. Um, why is it going to this screen? Oh, there we go. It's going to both. Okay. So that's probably enough about EEPROM. Let's start talking about some of the things that OpenOS can do. I'm going to re let's make the resolution a bit better. So DevFS has been added, and this really is a the beginning of many things that we can add to these dev points. Um, for example, we, we do have the EEPROM here. This is all the code that's on the EEPROM itself. And in fact, you can edit the EEPROM from this DevFS point. It can act just like a normal file. So if you want to make edits to how your EEPROM works, you can open it up and edit here. You can save. It will write back to it. That's the idea of what the dev points are going to be. They, they, some of them are going to be system information. Some of them is going to be act-like files that you can edit. Uh, this was actually a recent change to OpenOS. So we have EEPROM and EEPROM data. This EEPROM data is a small piece of memory that for Lua EEPROM is used uh, for the boot address. Again, Lua EEPROM, like I was explaining, is just the thing that looks for the init.lua, but you can write your own. You can put anything you want in EEPROM data, but if you're using the Lua EEPROM, then uh, it could write over it. So on this computer, we can see that the EEPROM data is this address. And this happens to be the address of the hard drive that booted the computer. Um, so changing, for example, the computer boot address Wow, it's pretty slow. <laughs> there we go. We'll change what EEPROM data is holding, because those are one and the same thing. One and the same thing. Um, this computer still won't, won't have a problem booting, by the way. It'll just not find a hard drive with that name, and it'll look for the next one that has an init.lua, because that's what the, uh, the EEPROM code tells it to do. And you can change all that. So, so you can actually see here on the screen how it's uh, going through all the file systems and looking for a file system that has an init. But just above that for loop, you see that it tries to use the one from the git boot address. So these things are all customizable. Uh, the other couple nice dev points in dev right now are null and random. Uh, random pulls a bunch of crazy random values, but you these are in bytes, so you can pull from that if you need to. Null if people who have some 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 time with the Linux Bash shell uh, or Linux environment get used to, to null things, you can just pipe into. And this this brings me to one of the first things that brought me to OpenOS, and that was to standardize all input output for all processes. And the reason that this really mattered to me was in the beginning, I was trying to write a remote shell that would leverage all input output to for for remote you know, visualization input of, of what you see from a process. And I noticed that there were so many places in OpenOS where it was a custom GPU write or a different path for input output. And so now this has all been brought into one place. And dev null piping, you know, redirecting to dev null kind of shows that. So for example, if if you were to try to uh, here let's let's go back to home. If you were to try to delete a file that doesn't exist, for example. 
you're going to get some red text. And I think, I think people are familiar with this red text, but the, the special thing about this red text now is that it's going through standard error, whereas the other output is going through standard out. It's a different color, but more importantly, definitely more importantly, is that it's going through a standard I.O. handle. So, for example, if you didn't want to see the error from a process, if you wanted it quiet, then you could redirect standard error, which is 2, into dev null. And then there would be no error output. Or if, for whatever reason, you know, let's say actually that you wanted to log all error messages, uh, th you could do a similar thing like this. Redirect standard error to some temp file. And then you could look at it later and say, okay, what happened? What were the errors? And this is now possible because all input output is standardized. Uh, two being for standard error, one being uh, for standard out, which is the same thing as, and if you, uh, that's what's assumed if you don't have a number. You can also have uh, a program that needs to, to read input. So for example, the install program, it's going to ask you a question, and, and we'll sp I was going to cover a little bit about what install does in just a second. But for any program that you write that waits for input, this is standard in, for example. So if we were to, um, we're going to do something with the yes program, which, which lists words or the word yes a bunch of times. So I'm just going to say uh, the yes program will repeat a word. So it's going to repeat no. And if we run that, if, if you um, pipe that into to install, then basically you're, you're saying no to everything a whole bunch of times. The first question was, <laughs> that's beautiful. The first question was, uh, you know, make a selection. And no is not a valid response to that. So we're just going to reboot. We're going to pretend that didn't happen. <laughs> so that's what redirecting input output is for OpenOS. Um, Everything's fine. That's right. Thanks. <laughs> so I'm actually going through this super fast. And uh, I've never made a presentation in Minecraft before. <laughs> so, um, so does it run Doom yet? Uh, no, it doesn't run Doom. Um, <laughs> we we definitely need to optimize how quickly we can render to the screen for that to happen. That's probably a good project for uh, a mod or an add-on to this. Wait for Grease Monkey's panel, exactly. <laughs> so one of along with making standard input output standardized is that it came with came with that was the addition of P open. If I can get the keyboard to respond. There we go. I don't know why it's so slow. So we can redirect. We can pipe input. We have find and grep now. And along with all of this came popen. And what popen allows us to do is um, to run commands inside of one command. So for example, with these backticks, this does what's called a, uh, a command substitution. So the command pwd prints where you are, but I can run that inside of a single command on the shell by using these backticks. And this, this all happens because of popen. And this type of work is underneath a lot of what OpenOS, OpenOS is doing now to get all the input output the same. There's a lot of other improvements with the shell, uh, improved parsing so that you can get, well, it's not responding again. It's quite slow for some reason. I can just talk about it. But you know, there's cleanup as far as where do you need your white space, um, other syntax. And one of the things that we might do in the future is extending the shell to allow even bash-like syntax for, you know, bash script code. Uh, there's an interest in doing that. Again, I run into the memory wall. It the 
somebody removing my keyboard? Or swapping it out? I wonder why it's not responding. I think it's just a delay. I think I just have delay to BTM server. All right, that's okay. I won't I won't show the demo of that quite yet then. Um Oh, it has a range limit. Yeah. Oh, look at that. <laughs> okay. While we're talking about keyboards and screens, one of the things I wanted to mention, or, or I was going to try to demo, but it's um, it's a little bit tricky to demo. One of the improvements for OpenOS is the ability for it to detect what screen it should connect to. What's interesting about BTM is it's rebooting now. I think we're okay. Yeah. Ah, thanks, Vex. You're right. I said to click in the middle. Okay, sweet. So, one of the things that I noticed in some people doing spotlights of open computers, which by the way I love, I love that people take the time to try to explain how to use this mod, is that they click on a screen and and it doesn't give them the interface to type in it. That's always simply because there's not a keyboard. And one of the improvements to OpenOS, I'm going to run behind the screen here, because I think there was a computer. Oh yeah, look at all these keyboards. <laughs> <laughs> so if uh so right now I've removed all the keyboards and oh no there is one hidden here. There we go. So now when I try to click on it I can't open the screen. And a lot of times for some reason I see in the spotlights that people will break all the screens away and they'll break all the keyboards away and then try to hook it all back up and sometimes they'll even reboot. And that's not necessary. Uh OpenOS has an event system which if if you start making some really fun programs, you'll you'll hook into that event system. And it's listening for components to be added. So as soon as I add this keyboard, um, I can use it again and I can start typing again. Because it detected that keyboard, it it's it's listening on that keyboard now right away. And in fact there have been some pretty awesome uh bug fixes recently with OpenOS because of that I found because of BTM. Um definitely some of the best bug bashing I've been able to do it was in the last three weeks setting up for BTM. Mark testing Marathon. That's right. It's been pretty awesome. So there's definitely some stability now in being able to swap out screens and swap out keyboards. And, and just to let people know, if you ever can't use a screen, but it looks like logically you should be able to, then, then report it as a bug. Because that's definitely something that OpenOS supports without having to reboot. Uh, can we do a multi-head, multi-keyboard setups? So out of... OpenOS without any added scripts. No, OpenOS uses one screen as the main screen, full screen. Does it support doing multiple terminals? Y yes, it's compatible with that, but there's no multiple terminal library built into OpenOS. Um, there was a, a member of the community, NPM XYZ, who has been making some awesome progress with that, and I'm hoping to one day get that code ready to a point where I would consider it an OpenOS library. But it, it's complicated, but it does support, it's compatible. That's the important part. In fact, the term library has been completely rewritten, mainly for memory optimizations, but I always had in mind multiple screens or multiple terminal compatibility. And um, in fact, in my demo booth, I'm using multiple screens. You don't see it, but this is one of the demos that I'm running in the demo booth. So you'll see at the top, it's got wide text, I'm actually using Unicode for wide uh, for the for the wider text. It's not like a resolution trickery, although it kind of looks like it. And there's a second window below. What exactly is delay loading? I will uh, I'll go back to that. Thank you. I kind of skipped it. So this program is using two windows. Uh, it doesn't have like a border, so you can't see the window. But this is none of this code changes core libraries to OpenOS. Uh, I'm just oh. I got kicked. <laughs> oh no. Well, this is actually so good what because um It's up. Don't but say that because now it will so. crash again. <laughs> Excellent. I need to make a mod that throttles uh, logins. Yeah. You need to make a mod that automatically knows when people are saying it's up. 
kidding. That doesn't make any sense. Okay, who predicted that? Did it break again? Yes. It was me. God. <laughs> Okay. Input, output, standardized, command substitutions. We have the dev points. Something else to mention. LSHW, which on this resolution doesn't look so great. Oops. I think... Maybe Vexito Sangar would disagree with me, but I think the majority of the work that went into making this command work was the debate <laughs> about what information should be available uh, from device info. So what we've added to open computers and that OpenOS is now consuming things to LSHW is that the devices, the components that are available to the computer can be queried and they have some basic hardware information that they report, uh, such as address, class, description, product, and some have more fields. For example, uh, you know, file systems might talk about, or I should say screens might talk about what type of screen they are, or the memory will talk about uh, what class of memory they are, although I guess that's class. But every device can now have a little bit more information about it. This information in the future may become more dev point information so that the dev the dev file system can show uh, what file systems are available uh, we could use this information for com so that your programs can know what type of processor is in the computer uh, so this is really the beginning of being able to make much more computer aware programs uh, this is where we should be able to pull that information or at least show it in a more interesting way because up till now it's been a little bit difficult for a program to know what it's running on and so we're trying to move away from that at least that's what this should be able to provide if there was more that Sangar wanted to mention about where we can go with this uh, I'll let him talk about it this this has not been my contribution I will say this was definitely uh, other people's work So the other thing that we want to show, an improvement that we've made to the experience of using open computers, is the install program. So on this particular machine, if we, uh, actually I'll show it through mount, right now we have all of these dev points, temp and dev don't really count, or sorry, all these mount points, temp and dev don't count for what I'm trying to say. We've got uh, an OPPM floppy that's in there, you can see that it's read-only mode. Uh, and then we've got, looks like, two hard drives, one with the address D29, and then the root file system 7FE. So if we were to go into uh, D29, it's just a screensaver Lua file system, and if I were to check the drive, we have, uh, oh, that's a floppy. It's a floppy. So what we can do with... Okay. The reason I was looking into that information is because install tries to intelligently figure out what you want to do by just typing install. So that resolution is pretty small. Uh, this program uh, does not need that much resolution. So we'll go with, I don't know, how does 40 look? Is everything okay? Did we lose it? Um, we might lost it. Um, yeah, it's not blinking. That that's usually a bad sign. My chat messages are not coming through. You guys see me flying across the screen? No. Ah. Uh, yep. There it goes. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'm not sure. Oh, it's back now. Okay. Every time I log in, I end up it's blinking at least. Yeah, I think we're good to go. All right. So what makes yeah, install? Yeah, the cursor blinking in open computers requires a server round trip. 
that's actually good this time. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I think we need like a minute or two for everyone to calm down. Yeah, the, uh, oh, you mean, okay, sure. And we probably need a recap as everyone's list focused by now. <laughs> the, the cursor blink requires a round trip because uh, it's actually writing a new pix it's writing yeah, a new uh, character why, there. But at the same time, OpenCompute is just trying to emulate uh, the existing terminal stuff to an extent. And uh, with real uh, virtual terminals, cursor blinking is client side. True, true. Um, also, um, for anyone who's recording right now, please, when you're uploading this to YouTube, edit the flash sign out. <laughs> please. We are a legitimate organization. Yeah. I didn't say anything important. I'll go over that again. Okay, let's, let's go. Okay. The reason... In... <laughs> Install requires or it deserves a little bit of time because it's been greatly improved. What it's trying to solve is the problem of what are you trying to install and where do you want to install it. In most cases, the the choice is simple. Uh, you're just trying to add an installation to to your computer. You know, you have uh, a data program on the floppy that you want to add to your computer, or uh, you're using the <clears throat> The maze program, and, and you want to install it. There, there's a there's a whole collection of loot disks, or even you can create your own disks that you want to allow users to install from. And then the choice of where to install it should be simple. Uh, you have typically one hard drive in your computer, and it's your root file system. Uh, but the choice can get complicated, and so install needs to show you those options, and that's that's where it gets a little bit different. So it looks like Vexitos has put in a bunch of different floppies in here. So we have the tape program that's mounted. We have the explode program. OPPM is in a floppy that's also in the computer. And then the uh, the D29 looks to be just another hard drive. And so it's asking, what do you want to install? Because there are files on all of these systems that you might want to add to your computer. The wording is important. What do you want to install? So it's finding things that can be installed. Uh, too many components. <laughs> Is he booting it back up? Uh, we don't need all the keyboards. Let's just have one keyboard. Besides, I don't really support multiple keyboards. I only support one. That might be a problem I have to look at later. So, let's run install again. Actually, the resolution. I think I liked it at 8025. Yeah. So for example, if I chose the maze program, where do you want to install it? There was a second hard drive, or actually it's a floppy, but it found a second file system that we could install to. It will show you the label or the address to begin with, and then it will tell you at. That's telling you where it's mounted. And that can be very helpful because you can see that the root file system is just going to be that forward slash. That will tell you that's the file system that your computer is, is running from. That's where your operating system is. So if the choice here is confusing, you'd want to pick the one. Generally, the idea is you want to pick the one that your computer is running off of, and that would be the root file system. If we chose number two, it would be copying the files that you picked, because we picked uh, the maze program. Yeah, thank you it would be installing the maze program to your selection here. So if we picked, for example, oh, I got kicked. So if you just press enter, for example, then it will take the default. It tells you what was copied, installation complete. Now this is the this is a complex example of install, to be honest. There were multiple things to select from. There were multiple targets to choose from. This is the weirdest or most complicated install should get at this point. I should mention now that install does allow you to write your own special install scripts. It will call them if it's named .install. This is uh, 
a detail that the, the documentation should improve on that uh, isn't very well defined documentation yet. That feature is there. Yeah, that's right. Working. Yeah, doesn't OPPM have its custom install ready? So another nice thing about install is that you can give it an argument, which will be the name. Um, in fact, let me clear the screen. Whoa, I'm rubber banding again. God damn it. Of course. Uh, the out of, oh, that looks like it's out of memory. How much memory does the system have? Enough. All right, I'll, lo I'll log that one for another day. <laughs> so here, we're going to pretend that didn't happen. So uh, if we choose OPPM, oh, not the... Then when I install it, it will, first it confirms, then it will run the OPPM installer. I've done this before. The main point I want to make is that when a floppy has its own custom installer script, you can, the installer will invoke it. If it doesn't, which almost everything does not have a custom installer, it will just copy all the files. So the quick demo that I wanted to show with install is what you should expect to see. Grabbing myself a brand new OpenOS floppy disk. I have a completely blank hard drive. Pop out these floppies. And an OpenOS floppy. Blank hard drive. Hopefully it's blank. So unless I've missed something, this should be experience make a brand new computer. Got your open, o open OS floppy disk in the disk drive. Got a blank hard drive. Okay, good. A couple things to notice here. This, so again, this should be your first experience with open computers. After you've crafted your screen, after you've crafted your computer case, the memory, the CPU, you put in a floppy disk with OpenOS, all loot disk, or sorry, the, uh, the OpenOS floppy, the loot disk that has OpenOS on it, and a blank hard drive. This is what you should expect to see. It boots up. And when you type mount, you see the root file system, just that forward slash, is read only. That's because it's running off of the floppy. If I were to try to create a file, let's say, Touch is a, a Linux command that will create a file if it doesn't exist. Cannot touch file permission denied. Because you're on a read-only file system, you can't change anything about the files on this computer because this is the install disk. So we want to install everything. If you look in mount, there's two mounts in here. One is the floppy disk. The other one is the hard drive. We don't need to worry about this complexity. All a user has to do, turn on the open computer's computer, just type the word install. Why are there two? Allow me to check what's there. Mm -hmm. Sample of what it will look like when there's nothing. Ah, there's these files in there. Um, delete people's crap. I don't know what those disks were. Just for this demo, I want to show what it would look like when there's no files. So I'm going to make sure I have a blank. <laughs> Are we, am I going to implement a way so that file systems can be mounted read-only? It would be easy to emulate an open OS. And I've thought about this, but I would really prefer it to be a feature of open computers. So if Songar's got a mic, he can speak to whether he's interested in supporting that from the computer level. As an emulated read-only file system is not as interesting to me as truly mounted read-only. <laughs> I break my tablet. But 
yes, I would like to do that. Okay, here we go. Looks like we've got a file system that has no files on it. So we've mounted, we've uh, booted from the floppy, and there should be no files on this thing here. That is correct. All right, so here we have an example of what I was trying to say before. Oh, I forget. I apologize. The resolution is... That's exactly what you should expect to see. There shouldn't be any complexity with okay, what's going to be installed, where to install it. All of that is the, the complex advanced situation where you've got multiple drives, multiple floppies all at once. But what we want the users to see is this. Just put in a blank drive and you have the one floppy in the computer which has the OpenOS operating system on it. Press enter. Copy all the files over. When it's done copying all the files, it will set the boot address. It's a label so that the hard drive doesn't have to show its long address and all the prompts. Instead, it can say, hey, I've got OpenOS on me, and it's good to go. This is really similar to the experience we had in OpenOS 1.5. A little bit of it has been simplified, and a little bit of it has been made more complicated if the situation is more complicated. And the reason we did that Okay, ready. It's, it's ready to reboot now. The reason we did that is because we want experience of using components to make more sense with software. Uh, I believe Sangar may have coined the term magic file systems. He wanted to move away from magic file systems so that when you put in a, a data card into your computer, we didn't want there to be files that would just magically show up, but instead if you want extra special software that was designed for the data card, then you should get the data loot disk. Put the data loot disk in and install its special software. The data cards, all of the cards work without special software. The special software are just helpful programs. Uh, it just makes it so that th these little special scripts that people have, that we've written to make these tools easier to use. But it's kind of like you plug in a printer and most likely your computer can talk to the printer just fine print out pages but if you go and get you know the advanced printer software so you have this pretty user interface and all these extra tools you can do that that's the same thing we are trying to do with the install disks so I think that's enough about install at this point um, important topic because people ask the question, what are all these loot disks for? Um, how do we get the software on? It should just be as simple as getting the loot disk, putting it in, and typing install. So one of the notes that I have here that I wanted to mention is when I was actually watching uh, the Dire Wolf Let's Play that had open computers in it, one thing I was concerned about was there was a little bit of misunderstanding about how to get these loot disks. And I'm interested in open computers one day having ability to create loot disks using the components and and that might happen but for right now probably going into the future again I would like Songar to speak to this because this would be his decision ultimately is that we have the ability to cycle through all of the loot disks so by using just a wrench in your hand and one of the loot disks and cycle through them uh, so say you wanted the open OS disk. Okay, Sangar says, uh, crafting the floppy with the component is planned. Okay. <laughs> so, if you want the internet disk, by the way, this is a brand new install of OpenOS. And we have in here wget, and we have pastebin. Because the discussion about whether or not these should be core to OpenOS caused quite a lot of, uh, let's say, heated debate. Um, so they've been added back in. But besides that, you know, so you do still need an internet card for those to work, but you have the programs there by default. You don't have to install them anymore. But curl. Yeah, we don't have curl. Um, but if you want software for the data card or any of the other cards, like the Redstone card, um, then, then the extra software would be on a loot disk, and you can cycle through them with a wrench, and perhaps one day we'll have the feature to create them with the component. 
pop in and you, you type install. Okay, we're going to move on. There have been questions in the channel about what delay load does. And um, I actually think the way I want to demonstrate it really quickly for you, about how cool delay load is. This works. Ah, hmm. uh, I can fix that. It'll be worth it if I can get this working. Just one sec. Hmm. Ah, see, call boundary. All right, so this is a test program that I write uh, in the emulator, and I this program doesn't have to work in the uh, the real game, so it's okay. <laughs> This actually isn't a bug that I need to worry about, um, fortunately. Um, but what I was hoping to show you was I wrote a program for my own testing, and what it would show if, if we weren't in Minecraft <laughs> um, is all of the libraries and all of their functions that can be delayed. So for example, uh, there's a function in the term library called clearline. Um, I apologize that, again, my resolution is horrible for this. No, actually what I should do write this to the, uh, how about I come up with a real command, echo. Um, if you don't mind me switching topics really fast, there's a program called, or sorry, there's a file under home called shrc. The, this is a list of commands that will be run when your shell is first loaded. So I just put in the resolution 8025 so that when the computer reboots, uh, as soon as it gets to shell, it'll run that. The feature that a lot of people have asked for, they continue to ask, hey, how do I get programs to run right when the computer boots up? Use the .shrc file. So it's, I don't care that this is crashing. Here is, now it's talking about a library called transforms, and there are functions in here that are not loaded, but they're available. So there's a transforms.where, partition, find, at. By the way, the transforms library, it's a lower level library that I wrote to make the shell much more advanced with parsing the text that you're trying to write. It, it really simplified the, uh, the SH library. Anyways, a lot of the functions are not needed for boot. They're, they're needed for more advanced things. For example, if you're trying to echo high and say, and echo OK, that works now. And a lot of this advanced parsing is possible because of the transforms library. Also, the spacing is optional where it should be optional that that works as well and that's possible again because of the transforms library but if i were to try to load all of the transforms library at boot um oh hey look i got rid of the uh the c call that was necessary if i loaded everything at boot then the the memory requirements of open os would definitely be higher than uh, we can fit on a tier one ram stick um by the way i for, i don't know if i mentioned that because of uh we got interrupted a couple times but one of the points that I wanted to make was that we wanted 50k of memory available for OpenOS on a 1.5 tier RAM stick. And because of all, all of the optimizations that we were able to make, OpenOS can now actually run on a single stick tier 1 RAM stick and install on it, which uh, is a little bit of black magic to make that work. And a lot of it has to do with the delay load system. So here you can see that, like for example, new memory stream, this function right here, it's not loaded. Well, new memory stream isn't needed unless this happens to be a... Who keeps writing? Um, the, new mem the, the memory stream stuff is what makes the pipes work. So, for example, to be able to echo, pipe into grep, the reason that works is because of that uh, 
that new memory stream. Probably stop typing while I'm trying to type. And now you can see a whole bunch more stuff had to load to make that happen. So the amount of memory that was available on this system uh, just got eaten up simply because of a command. And this was an experience that I wanted for the user so that just booting into OpenOS didn't require all of the functionality unless you start to use it. So for example, hint handler implement. Well, that's, uh, let's look actually at text pad left. So if we were to use text pad left, for example, well, I called, I used it wrong. I forgot the other argument. That doesn't really matter. My point is that I tried to use that function and it was available and now it's been loaded. So if you look at text pad left, it's now been loaded. That's my little plus sign right there. That's delay load. It does make the code. Yeah, we should actually grep for uh, what's not loaded. Still a lot of stuff that's not loaded. Lots of stuff. Um, but if you have a bug, one of these functions, it makes the call stack look kind of weird. And that's because it's not loading serial kind of way, but uh, that's okay. I, have to, I did that to save memory, so that makes it worth it. <laughs> Alright. Check on my notes. I think I've covered the most important parts of, of what I wanted to talk about. Does the, delay mo <clears throat> does the delay module include profiling, like number of executions? I'm sorry, can you uh, rephrase that? I'm not sure what you're trying to ask there. Um, I think what he means is um, if you run an, a large function once, Will essentially is it planned to have some kind of like garbage collection for the delay loader? Ah, uh, I actually initially implemented delay loading with caching, garbage collecting, cleaning up later, and I thought it was a great idea, and it it worked. The problem was that libraries that big expensive functions all the time constantly having to reload that data from the disk. Because of how the Lua garbage collector worked, it didn't really give me the the option of how weak. If there are ideas that the community has about how to offload expensive functions without using Lua's weak referencing, but something more customized, I'm open to those suggestions. But wrapping functions, wrapping functions. Yes, like you wrap a function to get uh, keep track of how often it's called. Oh, and then increase it, uh, and, and and then promote it, essentially. Yes, and keep track of how often it's called. You could do things like that that way. Sure. I was, um, I was actually thinking more on the lines of uh, you you trying to optimize boot, and uh, you know, let's say there's an expensive function you call once, but there's two or three lower functions you've already called ten times. Is there a way like? that you've profiled through this stuff, or is it just you read the code and you learned that this expensive function, you don't need to load it boot, and you'll just use some three or four other low-level low functions used ten times already, just to optimize for memory usage? Oh yeah, I've definitely done that. Um, that's where a lot of the savings come from, where there could be a function call to the buffer library, for example, but... I realize, gosh, I only call that function once, and really all I'm trying to do is read the first line from that file. I'll just hard code it in, so I don't have to load all that function in. Yes, that's the, a lot of the optimizations came that way. And so if you look at the code, you might think, wow, why is he doing this by hand? You know, there's library functions to do that. A lot of the reason is because of memory. Uh, another question I had is, um, so you're not the first that's looked into this. I know a lot of people that have, and I, I even looked into doing something, not the delay stuff, but the, uh, you know, save memory, make the boot system more interesting, make it more POSIX compliant, I think. And uh, so do, is there more of a correct um, abstraction for processes inside of OpenOS yet? A little bit. So that's and, where all of okay. the input output 
goes is through the process metadata. Yeah, and that's what I, that, that was one of the things I was looking at. I was like, oh, yeah, you can't do it because there's no process metadata. There's no way to keep track of everything. So, Yeah, we are, we're moving in that direction. Um, a lot of the improvements to process metadata had big memory costs. And I remember at the time I was working on it, it just wasn't worth the cost. I've created a little bit more buffer room wiggle room, I guess you could say, where future process improvements are probably more likely now without, you know, making tier one RAM completely impossible. Yeah, it's all about the process metadata. Um, it's even to have child processes and some type of tree and able to kill processes, for example, something that I can do in emulated environments that I haven't, I have not pushed into the core open OS yet. But yes, in fact, That's great. P, P open, which seems like a simple thing but by the way it took my entire christmas vacation to make p open uh it's it, i don't know if magic's on the line listening to all this but he he implemented a similar thing to get p open to work and was um and maybe other things in plan k that i'm not aware of but it's an entirely custom coroutine library that hijacks how coroutines work and that was uh that was difficult and and actually quite enjoyable to figure out. But because of that, um, <laughs> the process metadata allows us, if we want to in the future, um, and now I'm being recorded, so I probably shouldn't commit to this kind of stuff, but uh, because the coroutine library can be fully hijack hijacked and emulated now, yes, I could create a process list, process families, killing, sending special signals to different processes, multiple processes at once, although it's not true concurrency, but, you know, it can be emulated because we essentially own the concurrent the code routine library. Oh, I see. So you're just you, you since you own it on a per process level, you could keep that in the metadata as they create new code routines. Yep. Uh, and oh, yeah. and that's necessary for popen. So it's all there. Um, it's being used every time popen is called. That's kind of exciting, actually. It gets me excited. I, I, maybe one reason why I haven't implemented it yet is because popen was so hard to make that it kind of burned me out, to be honest. And I, it's so easy to break um, that uh, I know that it's solid right now, but in case I find an edge case of a feature that I need, it's a hard thing to debug. That's what I'm trying to say. It's really hard to debug. So another thing that I've, I've kind of noticed, you know, like open computers, the, the Lua operating system stuff, this is probably more of an abstract, less directly to you question, but... Has anyone ran this on physical hardware and finds that an interesting, you know, problem to solve? Because it's kind of getting to the point where that, you know, could be a really clever hacker it OS. Done. It has been done. Ish. Nice. Um, Magic and I, well, I only helped out for a bit. We work on Lupe, which was a project to run um, OpenOS directly mm. as an operate as a shell on top of the Linux kernel with nothing else running. And it actually exists. It works mostly <laughs> fine. It runs on Raspberry Pi. I've run it on my ThinkPad. I've also run it on the Zippet Z2, which is a really cool old Linux device. I'm familiar with that one. Nice. <laughs> yeah, so it has been all done-ish. We use the Linux kernel for it, but from there it's not that far to code a simple microkernel that would run OpenOS and use that uh, framework. That's a good question. <laughs> I do have some questions, I admit, but I'm waiting for the Sanger panel for them, for them mostly because they're related to open computers. Melanie, Celine. So I think that anything else that I wanted to cover actually should be running in the booths. For example, this is the advanced command substitution demo that's running in the booth. Um, and it tries to talk through, could I show the PyO tests? <laughs> um, the code, no, because it's horrible, although it's all on GitHub. So I think we should. Yeah, I think we should wrap up. Um, I just, the only thing I want to wrap, uh, direct people to was that if you had more questions about what OpenOS Shell supports, uh, go to the demos. I, I actually spent quite a lot of time on these. The, the top part of the demo will be instruction, a description of what's going on, and then I have actually a sub-window running. These, are actually, these commands are actually running against, uh, against the hardware. 
show you all the new features that have been added, or at least a lot of them. Um, uh, find me on OC channel on Espernet. Um, I visit the GitHub for new issues pretty much every single day. Yeah, again, thank you for letting me be a part of this. And thank you for helping make OpenOS even better.